I'm going to be talking about electrical impedance myography, uh, and I, my day job, 90% of the time or more, is at Harvard Medical School at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, but I have my own conflict, which is that I'm also part of a startup company, Convergence Medical Devices, and I will be showing you some of the work that we've been doing trying to commercialize the technology that I've been sort of investigating for the past decade or so. Um, so I, I'm going to take a slightly broader uh, view on this than I think some of the, the, the recent past speakers have. And I'm just going to talk about neuromuscular disorders in general uh, and, then, and then focus in on some of the sort of more specific issues with uh, the technology that I'm working on. But basically, as you probably know, the neuromuscular disorders actually encompass a large number of disorders. There are some really c common ones like carpal tunnel syndrome or sciatica. Uh, but then, actually, it ends up there's this you know, massive number of disorders that affect the nerve, uh, spinal cord to some extent, and, and muscle and neuromuscular junction that all impact things. And, and uh, so from our rare diseases include a number that are being spoken about here today, um, some, many uh, genetic, others acquired, such as uh, dermatomyositis, um, uh, nerve diseases or motor neuron diseases from Charcot-Marie Tooth disease to ALS, which I think would qualify as a rare disease, uh, spinal muscular atrophy. Um, and then uh, neuromuscular junction disorders um, such as um, uh, myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia is probably one of the more common ones, but there are unusual hereditary forms of the disease uh, where patients present with episodic weakness um, and some other diseases as well. Um, and the approaches to assessing these diseases generally uh, uh, is not always straightforward. How do you essentially evaluate the status of a patient and the effect of therapy? And, um, uh, strength measurements are kind of been the standard bearer and still continue to be in most of the clinical trials that we pursue, uh, whether it be in ALS or in muscular dystrophy. Um, functional measurements, we've obviously heard some of these discussed. Uh, questionnaires are still very popular. One I've got put up here is, for example, the ALS functional rating scale. Uh, it's sort of used, being used almost as the most standard approach right now for evaluating disease progression in ALS. Uh, the big um, dexpremipexel study being uh, uh, put on by Biogen is using a combination of this and survival as the, as the final outcome measure or biomarker, if you will, in, the, in assessing disease, assessing the efficacy of the drug. Um, imaging, of course, uh, MRI and CT and ultrasound even to some extent is being looked at. And then there are, of course, the serologic markers and urinary markers, et cetera, that can also be investigated. Um, but there are a number of limitations from a, from a perspective, neuromuscular perspective in general uh, on this, on these um, and we know, for example, strength measurements are often problematic. We struggle with this as clinicians and, and, and researchers all the time, trying to figure out what are the best ways of measuring strength. Um, time was when I was training, uh, we had these big quantitative strength measuring devices where people had to lie down on this platform and get positioned in a very specific uh, way and then do strength measurements. Um, and they were clumsy and difficult to use. And that's gradually sort of gone, off, gone away now. And, uh, handheld dynamometry is being used for a lot of these studies. But that, that technique also has considerable problems. It's also fatiguing to patients. Um, and it has real problems with the real floor and ceiling effects. If the person's really strong, you're going to get just a, they'll be too strong, you won't get a good measurement. And if they're too weak, you're not going to get valuable data either. Um, functional measurements. Again, you know, a lot of things like the six-minute walk, certainly a very valuable measure, and I think is being used in a lot of studies, as we saw. Um, but these two have their uh, inconsistencies. Questionnaires, even like the, for example, ALS, FRS, which I mentioned before, still have problems in that they're often relatively insensitive to change. Uh, so if you're really looking for an early, early signal, uh, they tend not to be a very good measure of, of status. Um, imaging, of course, such as uh, uh, MR excuse me, MRI is very valuable, but it's still often expensive and, um, and can often be inconvenient. Um, and for example, if you're dealing with children and you're depending what muscle you're looking at, you don't want to have to give them anesthesia in order to get data. Um, and so no matter what, if you do imaging biomarkers, you're often stuck with um, doing measurements relatively in frequency given cost and other limitations. And I think serologic measurements, I think those are sort of a separate issue. So what we've been focusing on, or the work that I've been doing is this technique of electrical impedance myography, and it's based on uh, the application of a, of a, uh, a high-frequency, low-intensity electri electrical current uh, across muscle and measuring the subsequent voltages that are, uh, come out of it. And this is essentially how we've been doing the technique for a long time. We have our device, which essentially puts electrical current through the outer two electrodes, and we measure voltage across the inner two electrodes, and this tells us something about the, the health of the tissue underneath. Now, electrical current likes to run through um, uh, water-containing tissues. It doesn't, very little actually runs through the subcutaneous fat, and almost all of it ends up going through the, the muscle itself. 
And so what you end up getting is a very simple, simple convenient uh, way of getting uh, data on the status of muscle. Down here I have one of the systems that we've been developing uh, at Convergence to uh, obtain similar data to this much more rapidly and, and more accurately and more quickly. Um, uh, so the basic concept underlying EIM is that changes in muscle composition and structure uh, of the muscle uh, impact that change occur with disease impact the impedance of muscle in unique and reproducible ways. So you can imagine that if you're putting an electrical current through this nice healthy tissue, you're going to get very di different data than if you put it through, say, scarred muscle like this that you might see in a muscular dystrophy where there's fat, uh, fatty infiltration, lots of connective tissue. Um, see the muscle fibers are surrounded by white stuff, the connective tissue. Or, in, for example, in somebody with a neurogenic atrophy, such as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, where you uh, get group atrophy, where you have fascicles of muscle fibers being atrophied and other fascicles being relatively preserved. So the basic concept here is that if you pass electrical current through these different tissues, you'll get different signatures. And obviously, the more severe the disease, the more ravaged the muscle is by the disease, uh, the more, more uh, dramatic the change is going to be. So some of the advantage of, advantages of EIM is that, uh, in terms of looking broadly at rare neuromuscular diseases, is that it's really looking at the relevant compartment for most of these kids and adults. Weakness, muscle weakness, is the predominant problem, and we're going right to the source of where that, that's happening. In a certain respect, it's kind of like a biopsy. I would not never go that far, but, but it's certainly looking at the same kind of things that you want to look at when you're doing a, a pathological analysis of the tissue. Um, it's fast and easy to apply. This just takes a few seconds to do, uh, whether you're using adhesive electrodes, which takes longer, or, uh, or non-adhesive electrodes. Um, and it requires minimal patient cooperation, so it's really easy to do on little kids even. Um, they don't, you don't feel anything when you do the procedure, um, outside of the electrodes just touching the skin. Um, so really any age group. Um, we can also focus on the area of disease activity, and this can be helpful in some diseases if you have a disease, for example, affecting predominantly distal muscles, uh, and there's certain types of um, uh, muscular dystrophies, uh, for example, dysferlin, dysferlinopathies, for example, can uh, affect um, uh, distal muscles more than proximal muscles, and you can really focus in on that area. On the other hand, if you're more interested in axial muscles, there's no reason you couldn't even check, for example, paraspinal muscles or other, other trunk muscles. Uh, and, and in ALS, the nice thing here is that you can actually look at the area in that individual patient where the disease is most rapidly progressing. And uh, it requires also relatively little training, um, and it's painless, as I mentioned. So I just want to give you a little bit of data. Um, this is some of the data we developed, uh, collected over the f a number of years. Now, this is back in 2005. We were just showing the repeatability of this. And you know, we heard this mentioned before. Repeatability, obviously, is the single most important thing we've got to, we have to achieve in order to have a good test. And this is data from a group of normal subjects um, that was uh, uh, just from one muscle that was repeated um, a, a few weeks apart, 30 normal subjects, and just showed very consistent data. And uh, on average change was under 5% uh, for this muscle as well as for several other muscles. And this is being performed by people who were trained in doing the technique, and this is with adhesive electrodes, uh, but still very, very high reproducibility and stability in a group of normal subjects. And this is also older data. This is from, we published back in 2007, just a small study, again, in ALS. And I'm focusing on ALS because that's where I have a lot of my data, although we have data from in other diseases as well. Uh, and here we're just showing deterioration over time in a group of 15 people. And this is looking at uh, one of the EIM measures uh, sort of combined from several different muscles uh, over time and just showing a, overall a pretty cons constant progression uh, in these uh, parameters. And, um, and this was a, from that same paper um, was a, a power analysis. It's a little complicated graph, but basically on the x-axis here we have the effect size and on the y-axis here, here, we have the power. And we basically looked at three different effect sizes, 30, 20, and 10 percent, uh, for different parameters and uh, compared um, the uh, EIM values, both uh, globally and also for a single muscle over time, showing that they had higher power up here, obviously almost like 99 percent power to detect a 30 percent change, uh, uh, and doing much better than um, manual muscle testing or the ALS FRS score. So basically suggesting uh, good, good uh, power uh, uh, back then. This actually led to funding from the ALS Association, and we completed uh, another study. Uh, uh, it's actually, I'm just writing it up right now, but basically we were able to look at the same data now in a larger population of people across multiple centers, um, again using this adhesive electrode approach. And um, 
we were able to find a, um, a, a very nice uh, rate of decline here. Now, the coefficient of variation in the rate of decline is sort of a quick measure to tell you how good a test you have, uh, because what it's looking at is the, um, the standard deviation across the individuals and their rate of decline divided by the mean rate of decline. So if there's a lot of variability across your group of patients as they're changing over time, uh, that will obviously impact your ability to detect a, a treatment effect. And likewise, if the rate of decline in the test is really low, that will also uh, limit the ability to, to uh, find a treatment effect. So if you have a, a steep rate of decline and a relatively narrow uh, uh, standard deviation in the rate of decline, you'll have a better test. And here, um, we, for EIM, we've got 0.55 over six months. Um, and you can see some of these people aren't even being followed out to six months. And if you compare that to the other measures, we did much better uh, than, for example, uh, ALS FRS score or handle dynamometry, the two other things that we were evaluating it. These numbers, although 0.55 and 0.93 and 0.84 are nice, they don't mean very much, but you can do a pretty straightforward uh, power analysis on this. Uh, and this just puts us into real numbers that with EIM, you'd only need 95 patients per study arm versus 266 and 220 assuming a six-month placebo-controlled trial, looking for 20% treatment effect, et cetera. So basically showing that by using this technology could actually really enhance your, your ability to find a, a, a treatment effect. Um, and what's nice about this, and perhaps from the surrogate marker standpoint, perhaps the most important thing is that we we're actually seeing that this data correlates to survival. So uh, we actually, I mean, the, this is not a super high hazard ratio of 1.4, 1, but certainly significant uh, that the EIM is correlating or, or, or suggesting something real. And you know what's nice here is that this, is, this isn't just looking at what happens to the patient over six months. This is saying because this patient has a more rapid deterioration in their EIM data, they're going to live a shorter period of time, you know, maybe a number of months or even a couple of years down the road. Um, the other thing is that these data also correlate to handheld dynamometry and ALS-FRS. And the R values are not spectacular. You wouldn't expect them to be necessarily. But the fact that the data is correlating to other measures that we accept as, as relatively meaningful certainly, I think, supports the basic idea. Um, one challenge I've, I've mentioned is how to get the best data. A lot of our earlier data collection was used with off-the-shelf technology. We build things around them. I work with a few physicists uh, back in the, in the early part of the last decade uh, doing these measurements. And, uh, and a lot of off-the-shelf components, uh, off-the-shelf systems from other bioimpedance companies. But recognizing we needed to do better, we started developing technology. We first had a, a collaboration with MIT a few years ago uh, and developed a first handheld system. And then I, men I should mention that, that we found that uh, uh, Jose Borquez is here as well, who's the co-founder of the company with me, this basically to develop these devices to do measurements more quickly. And if this works, it probably won't, of course, but let's see. Nah, it won't work. It's never that easy, right? <laughs> anyway, that was a movie of the, of the measurement being done. It's very, very fast. Um, uh, and this is just some ALS data showing that our data, uh, ALS data from uh, using the newest device, just showing repeatability. Mm -hmm. These measurements are done about 45 minutes apart and showing nice repeatability both for normal subjects and ALS patients and also obviously that it's differentiating between the two groups as, as we would expect. And this is looking at one of the EIM measures, the reactants. Um, so limitations, um, nothing is perfect, of course. And I think one of, one of the issues here, and this could be used at, viewed as either a limitation or a benefit, but it is a little bit of a blunt tool. We're not looking at, at a, you know, a specific serologic marker here. We're not looking at a protein level. We're just looking at some kind of gross change to the muscle that we are now quantifying using electrical impedance. So it is pretty blunt, and a lot of things can, can, can give you can change that. The advantage, of course, is that it means that it could be applied to a variety of, of rare neuromuscular diseases. Um, discriminating, discriminating primary muscle from primary nerve disease remains a challenge. I don't know how relevant that is, but, but uh, my colleagues always ask about whether it's possible we're working on it. Um, and the exact significance of the changes are uncertain, and this is always a difficult part. Well, how does fat or connective tissue actually cause the problem? Uh, is it loss of normal structure? And, we're I mean, working that out to some extent through an animal research program that I have ongoing looking at models in a number of different diseases. Um, and superposed conditions can definitely impact the data. So if somebody is in heart failure, you know, that's going to that's gonna, that's gonna potentially be a problem if they're, you know, a damnedest from renal failure. So there certainly are limitations on that basis. 
Fortunately, most of the people with these diseases don't have those things on top of it, but that would certainly be a, a potential limitation. And it's still certainly new as well. Um, so we've been looking at, um, uh, we're actually now currently in the process of applying this technology in a number of different diseases. We have a study looking at going, uh, SBAR that's uh, uh, hopefully uh, we'll be looking at uh, immunotrophic lateral sclerosis. Uh, we have some funding to look at spinal muscular atrophy and Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, as well, and uh, some of these other diseases as well. Um, and uh, we're still working on finding out the best EIM indices. There are a number of different parameters to follow, and we're, we're sort of trying to figure that piece out still. Um, uh, and uh, again, establishing for the surrogate question, you know, the relationship between EIM data and other functional measures, you know, really trying to d hopefully be able to show that this is a, is a good surrogate marker for a variety of conditions. And I think we just need to get the technology in as many people's hands as possible to get the feedback so that we can, we can make it better and uh, get more valuable data, um, which I guess I kind of said. Um, so I'll just end there. These are collaborators. It's been a long, long going project here, but lots of people from, from around the country helping participate in funding from various sources as well. So I'll stop there. Thank you.